and welcome to Washington Talk, I'm Eun Jung Chao. On Capitol Hill, there is growing calls to ramp up pressure against North Korea after the breakdown of the Hanoi summit. Many in Congress are also critical of President Trump overturning sanctions on North Korea. What effects can we expect from stronger congressional voice on North Korea? We must pursue the policy of maximum pressure, including full sanctions enforcement, robust military posture, and... I believe that North Korea has conclusively demonstrated that it is not under enough pressure to agree to a deal acceptable to the United States. been fooled enough times and so the, the steady uh, pressure will continue to have a, an effect. In the studio with me today, Dr. Toby Dalton, co-director of the Nuclear Policy Program at the Carnegie Endowment. Dr. Dalton previously held senior positions at the Energy Department, including acting director for the Office of Nuclear Safeguards and Security. Also joining me, Mr. Scott Snyder, director of U.S.-Korea Policy Program at the Council on Foreign Relations. His latest book, South Korea at the Crossroads, charts the evolution of South Korean foreign policy and strategic choices. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Now, there was a series of congressional hearings this week, and um, the legislators also asked um, Secretary Pompeo and top um, military commanders about North Korea. So there seems to be growing interest and concern on North Korea and also calls for more pressure on North Korea after the Hanoi summit. Why do you think is this? Well, I think the biggest concern for Congress is that they see that after the Hanoi summit occurred that we still haven't had any reduction of the threat from North Korea. North Korea continues to be able to produce nuclear materials uh, and possibly strengthen uh, the capability of its nuclear threat. But also I think that Congress sees that uh, the administration has not fully applied one of the significant tools uh, that was used against Iran in order to get a deal. Uh, and that was uh, the threat of secondary sanctions or secondary boycotts against partners of North Korea. And so I see Congress really wanting to push forward, uh, at least on the Senate side, with Cory Gardner and uh, Ed Markey uh, in that area. Uh, and then also we saw from the Hanoi summit that that's what North Korea wanted, sanctions relaxation. Uh, and so the fact that North Korea tipped its hand uh, to show that uh, it's concerned about pressure from sanctions, I think, has led to the idea that that might be an effective tool uh, in pushing forward on denuclearization. Mm -hmm. What is your take about the increased um, interest from the Congress? Well, I think there's also an issue here where now, for the first time uh, after the, the midterm election, you have Democrats in control of the House wanting to exercise more oversight of this issue. Uh, I think there's a palpable feeling that the Trump administration has not been forthcoming enough uh, about the strategy, uh, their plans for how to implement uh, a poss possible denuclearization agreement with North Korea, how to verify it, etc. Uh, and so I think you see now a, a lot of effort on the Hill to try to better utilize the oversight and also the sanctions authorities that, that Scott mentioned uh, to try to draw the administration out to better explain uh, what the policy is and how they're going to get there. Mm -hmm. And the legislators were also very critical of President Trump overturning um, sanctions on North Korea. And they also took issue with the explanation from the White House as press secretary saying that because President likes Chairman Kim, that he doesn't think sanctions are necessary. So uh, why do you think the latest developments cause so much concern? Well, it's clear that when Congress writes sanctions authorities, they also include provisions for waivers uh, for most sanctions. And liking a foreign leader does not meet the threshold for waiving sanctions, right? There have to be certain reasons to waive sanctions. Uh, and because of a personal relationship, that's just clearly not a sufficient reason. And so I think you see from Congress now a desire to have the legal 
uh, process play out uh, with sanctions um, to include if the administration is going to use secondary sanctions um, to go through the full process to do that. Congress doesn't have a lot of tools when it comes to foreign policy. Sanctions is clearly the, the tool of uh, sort of both first and last resort uh, uh, from Capitol Hill. Uh, and so when the administration doesn't use the tools in a way that Congress thinks is proper, then you see calls from Capitol Hill um, to, to uh, sort of fix the way that the administration is doing it. Mm -hmm. So do you think the Congress is more inclined to levy more sanctions in North Korea and the president is less inclined to do so? It certainly appears to be the case that Congress is ready to ramp up. Uh, I think there is frustration with President Trump over the apparent uh, repeal of sanctions that had been announced uh, by the Treasury. There's a lot of confusion over that. I think the confusion itself uh, makes, conference, uh, makes Congress uncomfortable. Uh, because it makes it appear that we don't have a coherent strategy. Uh, and so yeah, I think that Congress was very concerned about um, the way in which sanctions policy is being implemented uh, now that we're in this post-Hanoi environment. Mm -hmm. And also during hearing, um, Congressman Malinowski, former Assistant Secretary of State for Democracy, Human Rights and Labor, he grilled Secretary Pompeo asking whether Chairman Kim is responsible for human rights abuses in North Korea. And Secretary Pompeo um, avoided directly blaming Chairman Kim. Um, the next day, the State Department spokesperson did the same thing. So is this to continue negotiations with North Korea? Why is this? Well, I think that very sharp exchange reveals something about the Trump administration's strategy for trying to continue this negotiation, which is to continue to invest in the personal relationship uh, between President Trump and, and Chairman Kim Jong-un. Uh, and so Pompeo is, is effectively trying to shield that relationship from what should be pretty obvious criticism. Uh, now, let's be honest, this is Trump's own doing. And after the Hanoi summit, um, having said fairly ridiculous things about the responsibility of Kim Jong-un for uh, the situation with, with Otto Warmbier, um, I think uh, it, it kind of put Pompeo in an uncomfortable uh, position. On the other hand, for Democrats on Capitol Hill, there is a strong belief, I think, that the Trump administration is inept when it comes to foreign policy. Uh, you heard comments from, uh, from some other members of Congress to this effect. And this is just another example of that, where they get to make a little bit of political hay uh, out of what they see as ineptitude and a bankrupt strategy. And also during hearings, um, the top military commander says that there's no reduction in North Korea's military capabilities. So do you think U.S. and ROK should go back to the previous expanded posture? Well, I think there's a risk if you were to do that at this point that it would provoke some crisis and further breakdown in the negotiations. And I think now that the administration has chosen this path of negotiations, uh, it has to be played out. Um, and I think that, uh, that, that sentiment, notwithstanding the criticism that you hear from Democrats on Capitol Hill, uh, is where they're at too, which is we have to give diplomacy a chance, even if the chances of success are low. If you precipitate a collapse of diplomacy by returning to military activities, exercises, and so forth. At the time when military commanders are saying that readiness isn't actually a problem, uh, it just seems like you'd be uh, destroying a good opportunity for spiteful reasons, not for good reasons. So I think the, uh, personally, I would be cautious about trying to focus more on military readiness issues uh, until we've seen that this negotiation doesn't have any chance of, of going forward. Mm -hmm. And military commanders also confirmed previous assessments that North Korea will not totally give up all its nuclear weapons. So how can we strategize uh, based on this premise that North Korea will not give up all its weapons? Well, really, the, the task of the diplomacy, and I think what the Trump administration has tried to focus on, what has been emphasized by Special Representative Began, uh, is that both sides are going to have to change their trajectories if we're going to be able to come to an agreement between the United States uh, and North Korea. And on the current trajectory, North Korea is not going to give up its nuclear capabilities. Something has to change. Uh, the job of the negotiators is really to find the area of agreement between the two sides uh, in order to be able to uh, avoid confrontation. And so what I'm really looking for diplomacy to do is to take the respective spotlights that the two countries have and try to bring them close enough together that there's an intersection that can allow for a process that can then uh, address this issue of trajectory so that we can actually come to a positive, peaceful denuclearization outcome. 
Mm -hmm. And Toby, um, Washington Post reports that um, Special Representative Began um, sought your advice and your colleagues at the Carnegie Endowment. So I want to ask you mm -hmm. how you feel about the Trump administration's um, resolve to pursue the big deal with North Korea. How can we best pursue this big deal? I think the challenge that's been put forward now is uh, you have a desire for a roadmap, um, but disagreement about where that roadmap might end. And the, the big deal idea could work, in theory, if there was better understanding that the two sides shared some sense of where this roadmap would end. But clearly they don't. And going back to the, the Singapore summit and all of the diplomacy since then, there's been an understanding that peace and diplomacy and security is a necessary prerequisite for progress on denuclearization. And so you can't delink those things. And I think uh, the problem with the big deal is that it maybe kind of puts the cart before, before the horse and, and from the North Korean perspective. Instead, as Scott suggests, I think we're at a situation now where you have to define some middle ground that is on the roadmaps that both countries would have and that would allow you to build confidence through a process. The work that some of my colleagues and I have done has defined that middle ground as a comprehensive capping of the North Korean program, which would provide stability um, and could address some of the concerns that conflict could escalate uh, in the future from some provocation. Uh, and I think that's the way that we have to, to think about going forward. Now, the Trump administration, I think, has a, a very firm view that it wants to do things differently that it wants the big deal because this is Trump's signature style. Uh, I think there's risks if you let the big deal preclude progress that could be made uh, on a smaller deal that would actually, over time, lead you to a stable outcome. Mm -hmm. and but there's a critical issue here, uh, and that is regardless of whether or not you go for a big deal or a small deal, you first have to have full agreement on the destination. And I actually think that is the sticking point right now is that we need to know that complete denuclearization means complete denuclearization. Uh, it's kind of like when you're deciding where you want to go, make your destination on your iPhone these days, and you type in Springfield, uh, but it could be Springfield, Illinois, it could be Springfield, Indiana, it could be Springfield, Missouri, and if you're not careful and you press the button prematurely, you're going to end up in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. And so I think that what the administration is really trying to do right now is to make sure that uh, our idea of complete denuclearization and their idea of complete denuclearization is the same. And if you can solve that problem, then we can see what the process looks like because it may have fewer steps, it may have more steps. The U.S. does have an interest in making sure that on the road to that destination there are as few exit ramps as possible, but it's definitely necessary for us to know where we're going to go uh, and have an agreement on where we are going to go before we get in the car and go together. Mm -hmm. So I think Scott and I actually have some disagreement here about the desirability of a uh, defined end state. And I'm, I'm actually more comfortable if it's squishy. To take your analogy further, if you know that you're headed west, whether it's Indiana or otherwise, you know you're going to be on 66. So let's get on 66, let's head west, and at the point where we need to uh, better understand where that final destination is, then we can try to bring that together. But we know that it has to pass through certain early milestones. If you can't even get to those first milestones, then there's no hope of, of figuring out where you're going to get at the end. Mm -hmm. These different ideas are very helpful to coming up with creative ideas to deal with North Korea. Um, my last question. So uh, President Moon will be visiting Washington, D.C. on April 11th to meet with President Trump. How can the two sides best utilize this meeting to make can progress on denuclearization? Well, first, I think that this meeting is long overdue. It should have occurred either in advance of or following uh, the Hanoi summit. Uh, but at this particular moment, uh, the critical issue is to make sure that the allies are on the same page, that the United States and South Korea at the leader level have the same idea about how to approach North Korea. Mm -hmm. Dr. Dalton? Yeah, I think the, the a uh, calendar issue is a really acute one. Um, given how much time Trump seems to have invested personally in these negotiations, uh, the election coming soon means that he's going to have less time. And so if you don't figure out what the strategy is for the next several months that allows this issue to be managed uh, either at a lower level or through different combinations of, of, of parties, uh, then I think we're, we're facing deep trouble because Trump is clearly going to be focused on the election, uh, mm -hmm. less on other issues. In that regard, having a common U.S.-South Korea understanding about um, 
what can be done in this kind of interim period, uh, what we need to focus on in the next uh, interactions with North Korea, I think is absolutely critical. And mm -hmm. I agree with Scott that this is an overdue mm -hmm. uh, interaction between the two leaders. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll leave our conversation here and watch video for our next discussion. I think the most important thing we could demonstrate to the North Koreans is more unity among uh, the three capitals. That link actually has gotten much weaker. Relations between South Korea and Japan have grown more strained than ever, this following a series of South Korean Supreme Court rulings that allow Korean victims of forced wartime labor to claim assets of Japanese companies. Japan has also accused a South Korean warship of targeting radar at a Japanese patrol plane. Now, um, Dr. Dalton, um, this tension between U.S. and Japan, how is this burdensome to the United States after the breakdown of the Hanoi summit? Well, I think the agreement uh, within the administration about the path forward has assumed uh, a certain level of support among South Korea and Japan for whatever the U.S. would negotiate uh, in, with the North Koreans. And I think the problem that we see now is that the, the bilateral relations between Japan and South Korea are so acrimonious uh, that it basically makes that assumption null and void. Uh, and so there has to be, I think, now a reckoning with kind of the fundaments of U.S. strategy in East Asia and the requirements uh, that come with that for there to be uh, a high degree of coordination, policy coordination, military coordination, economic coordination uh, between the U.S. and its two key allies in the region. Mm -hmm. I think that historically successful engagement with North Korea has been built on the premise of strong trilateral alliance-based cooperation among the United States, the United States Japan, uh, and South Korea. Mm -hmm. uh, and currently we see the absence of that. It creates more space for North Korea to try to play off different parties against each other and to generate uh, tensions uh, among parties uh, that all have a shared convergent interest in North Korea's denuclearization. Mm -hmm. And I'll just add here, I think the the security concerns that Japan and South Korea have and uh, the, the U.S. is fundamental to helping them manage um, don't go away uh, with North Korea negotiations and indeed the kind of diver divergent um, political sentiment you see between Seoul and Tokyo is something that only Washington can help manage at this point uh, in the absence of any bilateral discussions about threat assessment and how you should uh, address it uh, in a denuclearization scenario going forward. Mm -hmm. But of course, I'm sorry, but uh, Washington is very ill-equipped to, to manage this right now, and that's really a critical point. Uh, we need to see the Trump administration taking more action. We haven't had an assistant secretary for East Asia uh, in the Pacific in place. His hearing occurred this week. Mm -hmm. We need to get him in place quickly. Uh, and then also the United States should be more active in behind-the-scenes bilateral discussions with both sides trying to push uh, Japan and South Korea to address some of the critical issues, especially on the defense side, uh, mm -hmm. that might inhibit their cooperation with each other. Mm -hmm. So are there areas of um, trilateral cooperation on the military side, do you think? I think there, there have to be, although given the sort of concerns in the naval domain that we saw with the, the targeting of uh, Japanese aircraft and, and the South Korean claims that those aircraft were uh, kind of buzzing the South Korean ships, um, it's, it's clear that as the, the most important domain is in the naval domain, the most problematic domain is the naval domain. And so I think there have to be ways to, to find common, um, common ideas that can allow for the resumption of normal cooperative practices. Oftentimes you see naval cooperation exercises around uh, less um, contentious issues like you know humanitarian uh, relief exercises or anti-piracy kinds of things and I think going back to just recapturing some of the small normal things that militaries do to cooperate with each other has to be an element uh, going forward of uh, getting these two countries kind of back on a more normal footing. Mm -hmm.
So um, President Moon's upcoming trip to Washington, would this be a chance to shore up some trilateral cooperation? I think that it will be an opportunity to reinforce some messages uh, at the leader level about the importance of the Japan-South Korea relationship. Uh, I hope that will be effective, but I also worry at this point that it may not be fully effective because on both sides, in Japan and South Korea, I think that what we have seen is that the relationship has become so entangled with domestic issues that it's much harder at this point to try to separate those. And it will require a presidential leadership in South Korea in order to effectively achieve that objective. Mm -hmm. And in South Korea, um, the largest opposition party, the Liberty Korea Party, recently coming up with all these ideas of having um, nuclear weapons for South Korea. Why do you think is that? And how can the U.S. alleviate South Korean's concerns? So th there's actually a long uh, history of uh, conservative South Korean politicians making statements about the desirability of nuclear weapons. Um, oftentimes that's been during periods of heightened tension with North Korea around some of the military provocations and so forth. Uh, but I think the underlying issue here really is um, an, increasing, an increasingly broad lack of confidence in the U.S. as a security ally, uh, which has been exacerbated in the Trump administration um, by uh, the problems with the free trade agreement, the contentious negotiations over the special measures agreement that uh, allows for the burden sharing. Um, and even before that, going back to the election campaign when President Trump made statements you know, questioning the, the um, importance of the alliance relationship to the U.S. and even suggesting that maybe South Korea should have nuclear weapons. So I think conservatives, the, the Liberty Party at this point in South Korea, it's, this is something that is kind of becoming a more common narrative. Personally, I think it would be disastrous if South Korea were to go down the road of developing uh, an independent nuclear capability and probably it's more damaging to its security uh, than finding ways to reinvest and, and strengthen the alliance to deal with all of the potential challenges that it might confront in the future. Mm -hmm. Well, I agree with that uh, last uh, point. I think that it's understandable why South Koreans are thinking that they uh, want uh, nuclear weapons on the South Korean side, but in the end it's not an, an effective alternative mm -hmm. uh, that would uh, be uh, positive for South Korean uh, security. Mm -hmm. uh, I do think that um, President Trump himself uh, is sending some non-reassuring signals uh, and that that is exacerbating the problem uh, and that we really need to get past that and provide a bit more presidential level assurance mm -hmm. uh, to our ally as a way of uh, avoiding pushing on this impulse for self-defense that we're seeing on the conservative side in South Korea. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll end our conversation here and move on to our next segment. Now time for the photo moment, time to look at an interesting North Korea picture. Today we have a picture of President Moon and Chairman Kim waving during a car parade in Pyongyang last September. This very picture is included in the UN Panel of Experts report as the acquisition of Mercedes-Benz limousine they're riding on is a sanctions violation. The Chinese shipping company recently penalized by U.S. Treasury is found to have transported luxury cars to North Korea. Scott, what's your reaction? I, this is a vivid illustration of the difficulty of uh, blocking all the loopholes in terms of sanctions evasion uh, with North Korea. And I think it's evidence, it provides evidence for why it's so important uh, that in fact we work harder on enforcement uh, the U.S. Treasury uh, sanctions from earlier um, uh, last uh, this week uh, and uh, also the panel of experts report I think gives a lot of recommendations for how to move forward in a way that is designed to stop this from happening. Mm -hmm. Toby? I, I fully agree. I, I mean, first of all, it's a nice car. Uh, and so, you know, kudos to, to Kim Jong-un for having some good style and good taste in his, uh, in his automobiles. Um, but Scott's absolutely right. You see lots of gaps in the sanctions implementation. Many of those gaps, unfortunately, involve Chinese entities. Um, and I think this, this um, kind of pattern of uh, Chinese uh, lack of full enforcement uh, and implementation of the existing sanctions uh, is something that is going to make getting to a final denuclearization agreement that much harder. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the U.S. and South Korea can't count on Chinese help to get all the way there. Maybe you can count on Chinese help kind of in some of the earlier stages, um, but uh, ultimately uh, this is exactly the, the problem that we have to confront uh, is how to square the interests of all these parties. Mm -hmm. Well, that's all the time we have for this week. Mr. Snyder, Dr. Dalton, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank yeah. you. And this was Washington Talk from the Voice of America, and I'm Eun Jung Cho. Join us next week for more analysis on North Korea.